we've got this neat little device right here. Uh, it helps our Facebook feed. The sound is a lot better uh, than it used to be. We'd have a lot of trouble with it. Uh, but today, first off, good morning. Um, I was very thankful to have had the past two weeks off uh, for a va vacation and work week. Uh, Betty and I had a great trip to Ludington. Uh, my family came and had a great time. We also had a very busy work week at our, uh, you know, trying to get things squared away for our new house. And we got a lot of work done. A lot of people helped. We had a work day one day and uh, about 11 people came from our family, her family, and part members of the church. And just, we were little ants working around, doing, getting a lot of different jobs done. It was very helpful. So thanks to everybody. Uh, God has certainly blessed us richly and has just taken care of us through this whole process. It, it, you know, it's a scary thing trying to buy a house. I've never done it before. And if you would have told me four months ago that we would have started a mortgage and all this stuff, we didn't even know we were going to move until uh, some things happened. And so God's blessed us. We're so thankful. It makes me very excited to keep laboring here at Davison for years to come, stationed at that little 2035 two, Mackinac Drive. So we're really enjoying that process. I want to thank Ben for filling in uh, the past couple of weeks. Uh, it's always nice to hear him preach again. Uh, I grew up, a lot of us grew up listening to Ben, and we always enjoy listening to him. Uh, also, a heads up, uh, the past few weeks when I've been off, uh, I, I got a really good chance to dive into the book of Romans. And so just a heads up, there's a sermon series on the book of Romans uh, coming, so you guys can prepare yourself for that as I'm preparing. But uh, first, uh, I want to continue this lesson series, Dangerous Waves of Change in the Lord's Church. I was thinking how funny it was when I first wrote the outline, I thought I could do it in one lesson. Uh, this is part seven, uh, and I think it's probably going to be about ten parts, uh, maybe more, I don't know. Each, each point is very important, that's why I wanted to spend so much time on it. So we've been discussing in this lesson series how the once unified Church of Christ in this country uh, is starting to drift away from God's pattern for Christianity. Drifting away from the pattern for teaching and doctrine. Drifting away from the pattern of worship. Drifting away from the pattern of leadership, the proper leadership. And drifting away from the pattern for fellowship and disfellowship. And we'll talk about that in some of the later lessons. And Christian living, things of that nature. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. We got to hear these things over and over and over again. Take heed, grab onto them, don't let them go, or you're going to drift from them. 2,000 years ago, the message was given. Uh, the pattern for the church was laid down very plainly. And for a long time in this country, the Church of Christ followed that pattern distinctly. We had some faithful years uh, in this country, and it, the Church of Christ was unified. If you saw a Church of Christ, you knew you could walk in there and all of these items on your handout, which I think you guys all have had it throughout the past week, so I didn't pass it out today. All the items on your handout, they're in unity with, right? But these topics are now beginning to divide the brotherhood over and over different places. Throughout the past 70 years, slowly but surely, waves of change have crept into the Lord's Church. Not talking about the denominations, uh, but some congregations slowly began to operate and teach more like the denomination than the Church of the Bible. Changes have caused once faithful congregations to be found unacceptable to God, drifting from faithfulness. Well, under category number two, that's what we've been working on, changes in worship, we have been talking about how much of the motivation behind these things, and we've talked about praise teams, we've talked about musical instruments, skits and entertainment, adding these things that aren't written in Scripture, much of the motivation behind these things is based on spicing up the worship service to make it more enjoyable for us and not necessarily in concern with how God is pleased with it. Does God, does God want these things in the worship service? Well, God told us what He wanted in the worship service. We use these illustrations. We said, you know, like a contractor who veers away from a specified blueprint that you carefully drew up, and he starts doing his own thing. Certain Christians are giving God something that he has not laid out in the blueprint. Like a waiter or a waitress who purp purposely brings something different than was ordered at the table. 
We are not giving God what he specified. Just give him what he asked for. It's very easy. Colossians chapter 2, verse 23 calls this concept will worship in the King James. It's translated in the New King James as self-imposed religion. Emphasis on that word self. And that means I'm offering to God something in worship that came from my mind and not from God's command. Nadab and Abihu uh, made this mistake in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2 in the Old Testament. They offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. What was wrong with it? Well, he didn't ask for it. That's the problem. Many today are not offering their worship in spirit and truth, as uh, John chapter 4 and verse 24 states. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There's this attitude that, well, God's not going to reject anything that I offer. That's not what the Bible says. So the next changes uh, listed on your outline that have crept into the worship service of the Lord's church. I think we'll spend some time here. Uh, hand clapping, raising hands, and emotionalism. Okay, I want to break these things down. Three items you see in, across the denominational world, but you don't typically see in the Church of Christ unless they're veering from what the Church of Christ has been doing. So we're talking about members clapping their hands to the beat of the song. Is that okay? Is there anything wrong with that? Uh, raising hands with the singing, with the prayer, we'll talk about that. Closing their eyes, um, putting on a dramatic show of emotionalism. We've got to be careful with all the different pieces, not to call something sin that's not sin, but I just want to talk about these things uh, and the tendencies that are making us look more like denominations than the Church of Christ. Okay. So what's wrong with these tendencies? Uh, first off, one of the biggest problems with these actions in our worship has to do with where they came from and why they're starting to creep in. Right? You can be sure that this over-dramatized, emotional type of worship is not found in Scripture. Right? And all these different practices, these phases that this world is going through, Neither is this a tendency that we can observe from generations of the Church of Christ in times before us. Right? We've said this over and over. You go back to the church of the 50s and the 60s, you wouldn't see any of these things. Right? Who's the one that changed? Everybody who's implementing these new things. We're just staying the same. We just want to keep the traditions and keep everything that's, that is written in Scripture. Uh, and you wouldn't find any hand clapping with the song. Right? That would have been a big no-no, of course raising their hands during the singing and getting all this different stuff you see in all these churches. So they would have been utterly opposed to some of these different changes. So what is the reason for these changes? Where is the church getting these ideas from? They're getting them from the denominations, plain and simple. They're getting them from churches that God did not build. And it's the same thing we talked about for why some Christians are wanting to implement praise teams into their worship. Why? Because the majority of churches out there have praise team, right? And members of the Church of Christ, God's church, have cast longing eyes on these churches that aren't even on their way to heaven, mind you. And we say, well, you know, why, why don't we have what they have? And uh, you know, we, we want to be like them. We want to be more like the denominations. We use First Samuel chapter eight in the Old Testament. Uh, it's like Israel who wanted a king. Why did they want a king? Because all the nations had a king. And we want to be like them. We want to be like the heathen nations. Our question was, why in the world is God's people, why do they want to be like the heathen nations, the Gentiles? And our question is, why is the church of Christ trying to mimic and copy some of these tendencies that they're doing in man-made churches? So that's where the motivation seems to be coming from. Is we want to do it. Why? Not because we need to do it or because it's necessary, but because everybody else is doing it. So we listed previously in our praise teams lesson uh, eight reasons as to why a praise team should not be added to the worship service of the Lord's Church. Eight reasons. We're going to revisit six of those eight reasons in this lesson because they also apply to uh, clapping your hands with the worship service in, in song. So let's specify on that first one. Why not? Why not practice hand clapping to uh, accompany our singing? Why not? Is there a problem with it? Number one, based on the list that we looked at before, all of these apply. Number one, there is no New Testament authority for it. 
I mean, flat out, simply, God didn't tell us to do that. Don't do something God didn't want in the worship. So we never read of a passage that says, Christians, you ought to sing and you ought to uh, clap your hands to the Lord. No, the Bible only specifies that we are to sing to the Lord. He never asked for percussion. We don't see an example of, of, of instruments or percussion. And, you know, some congregations will say, Oh, oh, yes, you know, we would never incorporate instruments. We know instruments are, would be an addition. That's wrong, but they'll have hand clapping. They would never implement a drum, but they'll clap their hands. And I just want to ask you, what would be the difference in clapping your hands in addition to the singing and beating a drum in addition to the singing? Do you find any difference there? Both are percussion. Both are not the specified act of singing. They're a different action. And God didn't ask for either one. What's the difference? And yet some Christians will say, well, yes, a drum would be unacceptable. That's an instrument. But hand clapping is okay. Listen, you know, if you go as far as to clap your hands with the singing and implement that practice, you would be just as justified as bringing in a drum because there's no difference. Uh, God never asked for percussion. Uh, I think Brother Earl Edwards said some good statements. He put it this way. He said, clapping is a type of percussion very similar to music we produce on a drum. Sounds very similar. He further noted that there is no difference in using live skin to make a noise, referring to clapping, and dead skin to make a noise, referring to the beating of a drum. Now, I think that's a, I like that statement a lot. He says, what's the difference in making a beat with the live skin on your hands and making a beat with the dead skin on the top of a drum. What's the difference? Uh, you know, so the truth is we have as little authority to clap our hands with our singing as we do to play any instrument. Uh, so I think that's a good way to help answer that. So that's number one. Number two, hand clapping is certainly not necessary. There's no need for it uh, to accomplish congregational singing. All right, we accomplish congregational singing here every week, and nobody claps their hands, and the singing goes great, and, and it's just what God asked for. Also, in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, I just want you to think about this concept. Uh, it tells us that when we gather together, we are to be teaching and admonishing one another. In psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, uh, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So one thing that, we, that our singing is supposed to accomplish is teaching. And admonishing, that word means to warn one another. We're urging each other. We're making sure we're on the right track. We're, you know, so the, the purpose is to relay a, a message that can be understood. Right? I'm going to sing with the Spirit. I'm going to sing with the understanding. So what does hand clapping do toward teaching and admonishing? Right, if you think about every act of worship that we do, every single one of them has a purpose. It's, it's an understood purpose. It means something. There's, there's a message being relayed. But, you know, do you learn anything when somebody claps their hands? Is there any purpose behind that? Are you warmed by a hand clapping in a song? Are you edified by a beating drum? Is there anything to that that encourages? So you see, hand clapping, it, it, we understand it's just not necessary. And, you know, for what singing is supposed to accomplish uh, in the church. Singing does just fine. Number three. This is a good one that went with the uh, praise teams. Hand clapping is a mark of liberalism in the church. We want to keep a good reputation in the Lord's church. For 2,000 years, the Church of Christ has sung a cappella. Read about it in Scripture. Without the accompaniment of, of musical instruments or any percussion, so now when a congregation brings in some new practice from the pattern to incorporate it, they are marked as liberal or unfaithful across the brotherhood. It's not a good thing seen in the, across the brotherhood. So my question has been, why would you want your congregation to be viewed as liberal? We talked about Titus chapter 2 and verse 8. It says that we're all to live in such a way that others will have nothing evil to say about you. All right, we're careful. We want to live in such a way that leaves no question about how much we are trying to serve God. I don't want another congregation being like, well, what are, why are they doing that? What's going on? Why, why, you know, we don't want our soundness as a congregation questioned by faithful congregations uh, across the country. 
So we want to be faithful. We want to be encouraging to the brotherhood, leaving no question as to where we stand. Number four, hand clapping is also something that causes division in the Lord's body. If, if I could pick one, this is probably the biggest one. It just causes division in the Lord's body. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3 tells us to endeavor to keep unity. Endeavor, that's a strong word. Try your very hardest to keep unity at all costs among the Lord's church in the bond of peace, bearing with one another in love. So the, this whole practice we're talking about has only done harm uh, to unity in the Lord's body. It has not brought congregations closer together. I hope you could find, I, I wish you could find one instance where it's brought a congregation, a group of five congregations closer together because one of them implemented hand clapping. I don't think you'll find it. One congregation firmly believes it's sinful. Another congregation finds nothing wrong with it, so they add it to their worship. What happens? We understand members of congregation A don't feel right fellowshipping members from congregation B because they believe they're living in the wrong. Congregation A certainly doesn't feel right worshiping with congregation B because they're scared they're going to be implementing that into the worship service. So instead of two congregations being able to be unified with what we know is right, singing, we're divided. All because one congregation wanted to add something that seemed appealing from what the world is doing and is really an unnecessary thing. And my thought is this, with, the, with this whole lesson series, if you know there's no authority for it, if you can't find a specific example or command, and if you know it's not necessary, and you know that it makes the brethren around you view you possibly as liberal, give you a bad reputation, and you know that it causes division and hurts people's consciences and all these different things, even if you don't think it's wrong, why would you do it? What's the point? Do you have to clap your hands when you sing? You know, if it's going to disrupt the unity of the Lord's body, I, you know, First Corinthians chapter eight and verse thirteen, with the topic of, of refraining from foods because people were offended, all this different kind of stuff. Paul says, therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Paul said, if it's going to hurt the Lord's body, I won't do it. It's as simple as that. Now th think about how many problems could be solved in the Lord's church if we had this attitude. You know, even if you think, even if you're convinced in your mind, I have the, I have the right to clap my hands, but does it do any good to the Lord's body? If you, have the right, if you think you have the right to do something, if it hurts the unity of Christ's church, and if it drastically hurts the conscience of many, Paul says, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it as long as I live. Wouldn't it be better to do what we know is right? Nobody has a problem with a cappella singing, do they? Do you? Everybody knows that there's nothing wrong with it. and So why not just sing? That way we can all be encouraged, built up. So you know, when a congregation takes the liberal direction for what they add to the worship service, they are disregarding the conscience of their faithful brethren. Say, I don't care what you think. I don't care if you're offended. I don't, I don't care if you think it's wrong. We're going to do it anyway. Well, that's not working in love. That's not living in love. Number five, this also applies from our previous list. Hand clapping gets the ball rolling for more change. It, it's, it's a snowball effect. You let one thing of that nature slide in and you've opened up a can of worms. And you know, if a congregation is willing to, to make this significant change, more changes are not far behind. You can be assured of that. Members uh, start clapping and rest assuredly, not long after, they'll be incorporating musical instruments with it. Because well, what's going to happen? We start clapping and we say, well, what's the difference in that and a drum? And they say, yeah, good point. And then they'll bring in the drum. It'll only be a matter of time uh, with opening this can of worms. So it's a snowball effect. Number six, and lastly for this point, hand clapping can be dis very distracting from the worship from the song. So the, the, the sound of clapping can drown out the wonderful words that we're singing. I will sing with the spirit and the understanding. Well, if, if, if it's blurred out, and you know, if somebody in the assembly believes hand clapping is wrong, if there's somebody in here who believes it's wrong and somebody else who doesn't, what a distraction away from the song. When it hurts your conscience and you say, well, well you know, should I even be here? Why are they doing that? I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. We went to a congregational singing a couple years ago, and some of you were with, with us. And um, during one of the songs, 
some members, I believe they're from a different congregation who was at, at this, they started clapping with one of the songs. And, you know, with that being on our conscience, and we, we don't believe that's right, uh, I can't tell you how much our minds were taken away from the words of the song. I don't particularly remember the song it was, but I remember it. Man, I love this song. And it bothered our conscience. We weren't sure if we should get up and leave, you know, whatever. But the point is, there's no real reason to incorporate these changes in worship. It divides the brotherhood. It does not edify. There's not even authority for it, so why incorporate it? Uh, it, it merely hurts Christ's church, and it does not build it up. All right, this one's interesting, okay? We're going to talk about raising our hands for the next point. Raising our hands in the singing. Sometimes you'll see it in the prayer, and that's and we're going to be careful here. You can picture the emotional scene uh, of religious people lifting up their hands toward the ceiling, right, closing their eyes and getting all into it. I just ask you, where does this practice come from? Now, I said I want to be careful with this one. Here's why. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. In the context of the public worship assemblies, Paul says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere. Don't miss the phrase. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. So here we have, uh, in addressing the public worship assembly, Paul designates parts of the men's role as opposed to the women's role. And we're going to talk more about that in, this, in later lessons. He specifies that the men, and that word there is the males, are to lead in the prayers everywhere. And that phrase means in every place. Every place where there's a worship gathering, men are to lead the prayers. And then notice that phrase, men leading, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubt. Someone says, well, how then could you say that raising your hands in a worship service isn't a good idea? It's right there in Scripture. That's all we're doing. We're lifting up holy hands to the Lord. And, you know, this is where they'll go to justify what's going on. And, you know, I'll mention in just a few moments that it is not, a, it is not an inherent sin. Okay, somebody raising their hands in a song, I ain't, we ain't going to kick them out. Or, or we're gonna, might have to, we might talk a little bit or whatever, but, you know, it, we can't, got to be very careful, okay? Let me give you five points. Five points to consider about lifting up holy hands uh, and what we should consider about this practice in the 21st century. Number one, first of all, when you study the topic, lifting up holy hands is a posture for prayer in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8 and throughout Scripture, it's not a posture for singing. It's not something you actually, you know, they'll point to this and be like, see, you're lifting up holy hands. Well, what were they doing? It's talking about in the prayer. You read through Scripture, and that's what they were doing. Most of the time when congregations try to use this verse to justify raising up their hands and, and swaying and all this stuff, we're talking about the singing. You know, it wouldn't be so much of a problem in just the prayers because all oh, our eyes are closed anyway. I, I, I don't know if anybody here raises their hands because I close my eyes in the prayer. But throughout the Bible, we see that lifting up hands is a prayer posture for when God's people would, would pray. There's really no mention of, of a posture while you're singing. First Kings chapter 8, and verse 22 says, I'll just give you some examples. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all of the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel. And he began to pray. Psalm chapter 28 and verse 2. David said to God, Hear the voice of my supplications. When I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary, I hear me, God. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 15. God is the one speaking here. He's speaking to Israel. He said, When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from, from you. Uh, even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. You see it over and over in Scripture that this was just a common prayer posture of the Jews. And certainly in this First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8 passage, it's a reference to prayer and what they would do oftentimes in their prayer. And that wasn't seen as a bad thing ever. Uh, in the first century, that was something that they did typically and, and all the time. But let's just note this. That's not the only prayer posture that's acceptable in Scripture. Right? Uh, does God only accept prayer when given from a certain position? And the answer is no. Right? In Scripture, we see that prayer was offered in several different bodily positions. Right? Standing up, 
1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 28. Kneeling, 1 Kings 5 and verse, or 8 and verse 54. Sitting down, 1 Kings 8, 18 and verse 42. Bowing the head, Hannah uh, prayed silently, barely moved her lips. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 13. Jesus prayed, looking up toward heaven with uplifted eyes. Right, so all these different prayer postures. Lifting up hands is, is just one of them. Okay. So God wasn't as concerned about the posture as he was about the prayer. Number three, therefore, we know that we have freedom to use any of these postures inherently. They're, they're not inherently wrong. So based on Scripture, it is not wrong to lift up your hands toward heaven while you pray. It is not wrong to not lift up your hands to heaven while you pray. Just as long as we're reverencing God and, and thinking of other, other people. Number four, what about in our singing? And here's how I would answer that. Based on the verse we read, I would be very scared. I would just have a hard time. I know it's talking about prayer, but I would have a hard time saying it's, it's inherently sinful to raise up your hands while you're singing. Okay. I would, advi- I would advise it's not inherently sinful, but it's very unwise in the Lord's church. If we have a freedom to lift up holy hands, if that's not inherently sinful, or, or we have the choice to choose some other posture. I'm going to bow my head. I'm going to do this or whatever it is. I ask you, is there any reason that would make you want to refrain from lifting holy hands? Is there any reason not to? And I say there's a big reason. Point number five, here's the reason. It is greatly associated today with the denominational world in the 21st century. That's what's different about it now as opposed to back then, you know, that we got to be careful. So what does everybody think of today when this sort of thing happens in the Lord's church? What vibe does that give off? Makes you think of the tremendously dramatic denominational groups who are trying to get all amped up in their emotions, and, and that's what it portrays. The practice is known really as, as a mark of liberalism across the Lord's body. Someone walks in, and, I mean, just naturally. That's just the way it's been in the church for years. Somebody raises their hands and be like, oh, is that person liberal? Maybe we've got to be careful with that attitude um, and, and give them some grace. And, and maybe they haven't been in the church for very long. Maybe they came out of a denomination and they don't, they don't know. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a practice that is not necessary. right? You can sing or pray without raising your hands. And so I wrote down, neither if your hands are raised, are you the better? Or if your hands are not raised, are you the worst? It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, so, but it causes division. It causes division in the Lord's body. And here's what Wayne Jackson wrote. I like what he said about this topic. He said, there is nothing intrinsically wrong with this practice. Perhaps, however, a word of caution would not be out of place. And admittedly, one must be cautious here. First, this practice in the modern community of Christendom is generally identified with the hyper-emotional Pentecostal people who are known to thrust aside scriptural restraint for the so-called charismatic experience. One may wish to consider whether he wants to leave the impression that he is inclined in this direction. Right? We're talking about our reputation as the Lord's church. Well, what message are we trying to send? Second, he says... The phenomenon is finding some, some level of comfort zone among the more liberal congregations of the Lord's people. The hands up posture may send a signal to some that a more contemporary worship is being tested, something more emotional and less formal. Third, one might consider uh, whether such a novel practice might create a distra- distraction for others. These are matters of judgment. But it seems that a prudent Christian might want to reflect on them. I think there's a lot of good truth in that, a lot of wisdom uh, from a man who's been in the church for a long time. So the question is, I called Stephen up about this, Stephen Rogers, and I just said, you know, what, what approach should I, I say? And he said, well, when you think about it, what effect is this practice going to have on other people? What if, what if, because if it's going to bother people, if it's going to harm the church in some way, why do it? Why I do it? The concept reminds me of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 23. He says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. 
we won't go into the direct context here, but the idea is, is even, even if we may have a possible freedom in some area, it might not be the most beneficial thing to the Lord's church to exercise it. Not all things are helpful. Not all things build up the church. I have a freedom to do it. Well, does it build the church up? And based on the perception of this practice in the 21st century, if you look across the board, it would certainly bring more harm than good in the Lord's church. Next, let's talk a little bit more about emotionalism. Uh, I think this is a good question. Is it wrong to have emotion while you're worshiping God? No. All right, we've talked about emotionalism as such a bad thing you know, in, in this lesson, but I don't want you to get the wrong impression. Uh, it's, is it okay to have emotions? Yeah, it's okay. And you know, in fact, you can't worship God acceptably with no emotions. And I would say that there are some brethren who could use a greater dose of it in their worship to God. Some sit in an assembly like they're bored out of their mind. I can't, it's so boring being here. And I'd say... Uh, you know, that has to do with worshiping God as first, or John chapter 4, verse 24 says, in spirit and in truth. Well, the spirit side of things is you're engaged, man. I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention. I'm, I'm excited to be there. My heart's in it. So if your spirit's not involved in worship, it's not going to be accepted. But when we're discussing emotionalism, we're talking about people trying to amp themselves up so much in an attempt to enhance their own religious experience. Okay. And they get their arm movements involved, and that's a lot of what it is. And their facial expressions, and uh, they'll, they'll purposely get themselves so worked up. Some people will start crying on purpose, that they just get so emotional. And there's nothing wrong with crying. You guys have heard me preach. I cry. As if, as, and it's as if they're too bored by the songs themselves, by the sermons. too boring. The Lord's Supper. The prayers, the five acts of worship don't stimulate me enough. I need something else to help me get involved in, in this. you got to bring, bring in some outside physical stimuli to help you get more out of worship. And at that point, the emphasis when we're talking about this concept becomes much more on how, how much can I feel out of worship more than how much can I give to God. And that's the point. And I, I wrote down this phrase, what, what all this is, and when you've when you got to bring all this in, or I can't get a good religious experience, it's an outside, it's a self-stimulation. It becomes a self-stimulation to enhance the worship experience. And it's really just another form of will worship. That's what I want. Last point I'll address very quickly today. And Al mentioned this one to me before the service started. And he said, you might want to say something about applause. And clap, we're talking about clapping your hands after the song. Might even want to be careful with uh, you know, doing it after a baptism. I don't know. It, uh, that might not be worship, so maybe not take that off. Applauding the speaker after the speaker has given a lesson. Oh, they're really good. We, that was great. Um, I'll keep the answer simple to this but in, in brief because you'll understand it. Worship is something that we are performing to God. You want to look at it that way. We are the performers, and God is the audience, not us. Even though you guys are listening to what I'm saying, we are all the audience, and God is paying attention to what we're doing right now. And when we applaud one of the acts of worship, somebody leading the act of worship or who did the song, they did a great job on that song. We're missing the whole point of worship. Right? It gives us a way, really, that... We have that entertainment value. It's like, oh man, I, that, that was great. You did, you know, it was wonderful. And we think we're the audience. We're not the audience. And we're, we're here to bring uh, an offering to the Creator. Or we're, yeah, we're here to bring an offering to God, the Creator. So, so I've said this before, and I'll wrap up with this point. Uh, if anyone is going to be clapping or applauding the worship service, let it be God. Let God be up in heaven. I really enjoyed that song. Let it be him. Uh, because he's the audience of our worship, and we're the performers, so to speak. We're offering it to God. So some good things for us to think about. We'll keep going with this lesson series soon. Um, talk about women's role in the church next week. And there's a lot of important things to say about that, a lot of misunderstandings with why the Bible teaches it. Um, but if you're not a Christian today, if you're listening online or on Zoom, you've got to become a Christian. You've got to hear the message. 
in order to go to heaven. You've got to believe it. You've got to repent. You've got to confess Christ before men and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And you will come up out of that water, a new creature, dedicating your life to Jesus Christ. And you have to remain faithful unto death. If anybody would like to do that today, we can accommodate you as we stand and as we sing. I am coming to the cross. I am poor.